There's just a little, little disclaimer. I call it explanation difficulties. In the book you find quite a few thought experiments and, and you try to find some explanation, um, some applications as well. But either way, it makes it kind of tough to explain relativity because thought experiments seem to be seem kind of weird and the real applications actually require students to know about particle accelerators and satellites going at high speeds so understanding um, the technology the clocks that are being used on satellites it requires them to know something about muons or the binding energy of nu atomic nuclei so it's just a little bit out kind of should, should be special relativity should be maybe taught after um, a semester of atomic physics because it's like oh yeah now I'm familiar with what's going on here the Compton effect and the Michaels Morley experiment and, and so on so that makes it somewhat hard anyway here is a particle accelerator um, the one I pulled well, I guess for some reason I pulled again a uh, German one is, is called Daisy in Hamburg, Germany, where they have these two rings here called Hera and Petra, and electrons are moving around here. Dizzy, I believe, stands for German Electron Synchrotron Experiment, and that's what it says here. Special relativity is strain strongest direct evidence comes probably from particle accelerators in which subatomic particles such as electrons, positrons, and many, many others are accelerated to within a few inches per second of the speed of light we can observe very clear and accurately changes in for instance the apparent masses of the particles as well as I'm, I'm just saying that here as well as the time they take to go around as far and as well as the distance that they actually travel so time dilation goes in um, mass increase goes in length contraction goes in there even the um, adding of velocities goes in there because as these are turning around here they are accelerated and an accelerated electric charge needs to send out radiation and the speed of the radiation would be non relativistically the speed of light plus the um, speed with which the particles are traveling but that's not the case it has to be added relativ relativistically satellites these are all all kinds of satellites maybe I can make this a little bigger here so we can actually see there more so all kinds of satellites in geostationary orbits where they orbit around the earth in exactly 24 hours or perhaps in closer orbits all kinds of here and then we have meteorology satellites and communication satellites and I don't know if they show spy satellites here I think they only show the the other ones here. Um, these here are the GPS satellites, global positioning systems, and they're orbiting actually closer than what's shown here, but they wanted to get them all into just one frame here. And then it says, the one that I copied down here, each satellite carries with it an atomic clock that ticks with an accuracy of one nanosecond. A GPS receiver in an airplane determines the current position heading by comparing the time signals received from a number of GPS satellites. That's just an example here. And triangulating on the known positions of each satellite, the position is phenomenal, and so on. And then to achieve this level of precision the clock takes from the GPS satellites must be known to an accuracy of 20 to 30 nanosecond hour because the satellites are constantly moving relative to observers on the Earth. Effects predicted by the special and general theories of relativity must be taken into account to achieve the desired 20 to 30 nanosecond accuracy. And so with GPS satellites we're able to determine our position with in just a few meters or feet and you know these little handheld GPS um, receivers um, or perhaps our speed. I, I've taken my GPS receiver along in the car and noticed that, oh, the speed that it shows matches the speed that the speedometer in, in my car matches. It. Okay, and I was the passenger, passenger at that time, by the way. Um, but if it didn't take these effects due to special relativity and general relativity into account, that fast-moving satellites do 
are in a time dilation and I mean they're not that fast moving compared to the speed of light they're only moving at 15,000 miles an hour which is roughly four miles per second and four miles per second is pretty small compared to 186,000 miles per second for the speed of light but even that tiny relativistic effect is important and if not taken into account there is no way that a GPS unit would give you an accurate position within just a few meters or feet. Among the many experiments that can be done is for example the Compton effect. You usually find that in an in introductory physics book as well where we have an electron ex at rest here and we have a photon arriving here usually an x-ray or a gamma ray and the two collide and just like billiards ball they're going off so here's the scattered photon and here's the electron and then with um, the equations for the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum you we would figure out what the formula is for the shift here in frequency and wavelength and then this one is the formula but this one required the derivation using special relativity so I'm going to show that so here's the der derivation and again here are these energy and momentum equations and here it is e equals mc squared and then the relativistic energy momentum relation this one has to be taken into account and then they do go through the algebra here and they eventually it's a little bit of work but you see it it's not that long actually it takes about one page um, they come up with this equation for the wavelength shift looks kind of neat here what would happen if this one here is not taken into account normally energy would be expressed as kinetic energy is the momentum p squared divided by two times the mass but notice that relativistically it looks quite a bit different there's that rest energy in there and then you have this looks kind of like a Pythagorean formula here so relativis relativistically it looks quite a bit different I did the calculation on the side uh, what would happen if I didn't treat that relativistically and I just wrote down the result notice that this equation here is looks a whole lot more complicated that actually should be a little index here mass of the electron um, looks a whole lot more complicated than this one up here which is not a criterion for saying that one of them is better than the other what is a criterion for is to analyze what the data well I'm sorry what the data actually are and I did that so I found some data on hyperphysics and they measured the wavelength of the scattered photon and this is kind of like like billiards where they the photon or one billiard ball goes off at an angle of 45 degrees 90 degrees and it kind of like go almost comes back here at 135 degrees and and that's kind of as I said earlier that's kind of um, what the Compton effect reminds one of so I analyze those data and these are the measurements and when I do a relativistic calculation I come up with this and notice they're relatively similar right but when I do a non relativistic calculation remember my more complicated formula earlier actually I'm not that far off either and the reason is that both of these are actually pretty close is that these are x-rays and they still have a low enough energy that relativistic effects actually are not that much playing into it so I looked for other data and I found this from a book that I have in my office where they're using gamma radiation from the radioactive cesium-137 and they give these measurements for the wavelength much smaller wavelength than these up here which means much higher energy and the relativistic computation shows these data and my non-relativistic computation shows these data and when we show them here on a diagram then the red dots the red squares here are the measurements 
for the different angles and coming up with different wavelengths. And then the crosses here are the relativistic calculations and the orange circles here are the non-relativistic calculations and notice that these two, the relativistic computations, are much closer to the actual measurements than the non-relativistic ones. So overall what I wanted to show you with the Compton effect is that we take the relativistic effect into account and we come pretty close to the actual result if we do not pay attention to relativity, we're quite a bit off. Notice for example on the last data point here 451 is quite a bit off from 569. The relativistic 526 is quite a bit closer. Nuclear fusion and nuclear fission as well. Of course, the picture, the diagram would, would look different and the calculation would be different, but in principle, I would be able to compute the same, which is what's called the mass deficit. And in nuclear fusion, which is what the sun is doing in its core, it's taking all the hydrogen and fuses it to helium. And here's kind of a chain of what's happening. Basically, it takes four hydrogens, and you can see actually there's a fifth and a sixth coming in, but the fifth and the sixth eventually is being expelled again. Um, so basically, four hydrogen atoms will eventually fuse into one helium atom. These are the mass numbers that you find on the on any um, periodic table of the elements and it says for hydrogen which has one proton or neutron in its nucleus it has an atomic mass number of 1.00794 and since four of them involved when you add the mass you come up with 4.03176 atomic mass units. Now the result is the helium and it says helium-4 because it has two protons and two neutrons, so four particles together. And you look up the mass, it has 4.00260 atomic mass units, and that's less than what the four hydrogens had before. So you subtract the two, and we come up with a mass deficit of 0 0.02916. Um, where's that mass deficit? What happened to it? Well, the helium here needs some kind of binding energy, and that binding energy was given off by the gamma rays over here and by kinetic energy and here's also neutrinos and their positrons coming out that will react with electrons and becoming energy as well and so this mass deficit here that's yeah, how much is lost so to say multiply that by c squared and you come up with the energy that um, was given off that is being used as binding energy or that it lacks in, in energy in, in the core of the helium nucleus and it keeps it together. And I have a few more examples. Synchrotron radiation, I had mentioned that early as I was looking at the accelerators, where we wouldn't at the velocities but in, in a non-relativistic way but we would use the relativity um, relativistic velocity addition. Muons, you find that um, in almost every introductory physics book it's, it's one of the first experiments taken around uh, in around 1950 where muons were observed to arrive at the Earth even though they should have decayed in the atmosphere but of course time dilation is involved length contraction so even though they were supposed to decay because of time dilation effects at their high speeds they actually did reach the Earth's surface. Atomic orbitals and here it says for elements with high atomic number Z the effects of relativity become more pronounced and especially so far as electrons which move at relativistic velocities as they penetrate screening on near the core of high Z atoms. So if we envision that the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus, then they must do so at high speeds and uh, relativistic effects will be seen and so on. And it says here, this is something I just I just learned. Examples of significant physical outcomes of this effect include the lowered melting temperature of mercury making it liquid at a lower temperature which results from 6x electrons not being available for metal bonding and the golden color of golden cesium 
which results from narrowing of 6s to 5 transition energy to the point that visible light begins to be absorbed. If you have taken chemistry, then you know what these 6s, 5d, 5d, 1s orbitals mean. And quasars or any kind of objects that are moving at high speed, I just use quasars here as just one example. So I'm going to go to this website. And the, here we have galaxy or galaxy cluster, supercluster, a quasar, a black hole, and so on. And they have these distance here, z, 10.3, 10.3, which can only be calculated if the relativistic Doppler effect is taken into account. And let's see if I'm able to arrive there. Relativity, where to go? There we go. And the Doppler shift and it's right here and that's what I copied on there. You have seen this equation before in optics as well as in sound but without the square root. We have just seen this one here, this one here and then you have the speed of light here for small speeds such as the radar gun that's used by police officers or um, sound waves but relativistically there's a square root involved here so I copied that equation down here strictly from hyperphysics and yeah this one here is defined as z plus one the z being a measurement for a distance through the universe so overall I try to get an, give an overview of relativity special relativity with mostly real experiments and real applications of that and again it's hard to do. Where did I mention that? I think... Yeah, where did I mention that? Here. Explanation difficulties that, well, you know, you're unfamiliar with, with the exams that I use. Particle accelerators, the Compton effect, um, muons, and so on. But these would be the real explanation... Um, not explanation, applications. Um, because here we have particles that are moving at high enough speeds respectively the accuracy is high enough the importance is high enough for example for GPS satellites that relativity needs to be taken into account I left out as you notice the thought experiments except maybe yeah for for this one here or my little example earlier let's see where I go here this one here but uh, because you see those in the book and you see them in other videos and I wanted to focus on the yeah, real applications.